are listening to part 13 of our 20-part series, Marvelous Mints, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Wade at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan. Welcome to Time Monk Radio. Thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to be here with you, Gemini, and all of your listeners. When last we talked last week, we were talking about lemon balm, and you were saying that that was uh, one of the mints that you were especially fond of. It is. I love lemon balm. I have it growing um, in my garden. It likes to pop up wherever it wants, and I um, accommodate that. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. It can get quite bushy, too. It it does. And, you know, and we had a pretty harsh winter early on. um, Well, fall, I should say, a harsh fall. And it didn't mind. It just kept on going. We just went out to visit our lemon balm the other day, and it was brown with all of its leaves on the ground. It's sitting out too cold for me. Oh, and ours, we still have green. <laughs> all right. It goes well into the cold, but we have back temperatures down in the 20s, and that's just way too cold for that lemon balm. As it is for the plant that we're going to be talking about tonight, which is Tulsi or Tulasi. And it, it Tulasi is Sanskrit for the incomplete. Terrible one. Have you ever heard of Tulsi? Is that holy basil as well? That is holy basil. You're yes. absolutely right. Yes. What have you heard about it? Um, you know, I've just heard that it has, uh, uh, that it's an adaptogen and that it um, works where it needs to. Um, and it's one of my husband's favorite herbs to drink as tea. Does he grow it or does he just get tea bags? He grows it. Um, we He had several plants, lost some through last winter, but he has a couple left. Yes, I was going to say, because it is not very frost hardy. It's not at all. And we had no, a couple we, come it, back up. Exactly. It is native, in fact, to the Indian subcontinent. Well, no wonder it doesn't do well here in the States. <laughs> no, it does not. And it's cultivated mostly throughout the Asian tropics. So Tulsi is definitely a plant that if we're going to grow it, we're probably better off growing it in a pot and or treating it like um, a tomato. In other words, we, we treat tomatoes like annuals, right? Yes. Yes. Well, in parts of the world where it does not freeze, they're perennials. Okay. I'll have to let him know that. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a, the, he's not doing anything wrong. It's just that Tulsi really, really likes it warm. Now, the Tulsi that I've seen people grow is usually green-leaved Tulsi. What kind does he grow? You know, I'm thinking it's more of a purplish green, but I'd have to ask him. But I thought it had a purplish color to it. I can't recall. Well, it's, there are two varieties, the green, the green one and the, the purple one. Okay, I think we have the purple one. Yeah, and Tulsi is a very important um, plant in terms of religion as well as in terms of medicine and possibly culinary use as well. And the green-leaved Tulsi is said to be Lakshmi's Tulsi. And, of course, Lakshmi is a wonderful Hindu goddess. And the purple leaves one is Krishna's Tulsi. Oh, nice. Okay. Right. Now, we all remember the Hare Krishnas back in the 60s, right? In the 70s. Yes. Yes. Hari, Hari, Krishna, Krishna, right? So, Krishna actually has many kind of names and associations. And Krishna is said to be an avatar of Vishnu. So it's like Vishnu is kind of a bigger kind of being or deity. And Vishnu, like when you play a computer game, has avatars on earth to be representative. And those include Krishna, Rama, and Hanuman, the monkey god. And so the Tulsi is very important to the people who the Hindu people who are involved in worshiping Vishnu. And as you recall, when 
you are a Hindu, you can basically choose to have a deity, several deities, no deities. Um, it, it's a, a pretty much um, how you would like to do it, but people do focus in on one particular deity. And interestingly enough, that is often Vishnu or Krishna. And Tulsi then becomes something that you wouldn't eat. Okay, that makes sense. Right, it's it's just it's too sacred. Okay. You just you don't like to have it around the kitchen. You could if you picked fresh tulsi leaves and then offered them to a deity, you could like eat one or two raw tulsi leaves. That would not be an offense. So the other side of that would be like cooking tulsi with meat. That would be just like <clears throat> horrible beyond words. Right? right, yes. As a matter of fact, the Hare Krishna's Prohibit the use of Tulsi in medicine. I had no idea. I said, no, 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 no. This, this plant is strictly for spiritual upliftment. That's it. We're not going to eat it. We're not going to use it as medicine. We're not going to use it except as an offering. And so the Tulasi leaves are plucked and offered to Lord, Lord Krishna. And this extends so far that even cutting a branch of Tulsi is considered to be a horrible offense. Well, I'm definitely going to have to share this information. <laughs> right. So when we're saying, you know, that Tulsi or Tulasi is the incomparable one, the holy of holies, it really is. And by some people, it really is considered. It would be like if you, like, Threw a Bible in with your stew. Oh my gosh! No, right? It's like it's that that important. According to the people who uh, the Hindus who are into Vishnu, the world started when the gods had an ocean churning contest. And I actually think that this is probably true of, of most Hindus, because I've seen and heard about this a lot. There's many depictions of the idea that the ocean was going to be turned, but it's especially associated with Vishnu. And the gods did indeed win the ocean turning contest. And the divine medical god... Um, came up from the ocean with Amrita, which is the nectar of immortality, to give to the win winners, and was so happy that it was the gods um, who had won that um, Davantari, uh, the divine medic, was crying. And as those tears fell into the Amrita, into the nectar of immortality, they became Tulsi. That's an interesting story. Very nice. Isn't that a lovely story? It that, is that, lovely. That, uh, Tulsi is the tears of joy. I've never, I've never heard of a story about a plant that the plant sprung up from tears of joy. I, it's like wow, you know, at the very creation of the world, the tears of joy that accompanied the creation of the world brought forth this plant for the joy of all human beings. That's wonderful. And, you know, just to even have it growing in our yard and we and when we lost it to the frost and to have it spring back up, we just felt so honored that it visited with us again. And so hearing this makes it all the more so. Yes. Um, again, among the people to whom Tulsi is sacred, the um, leaves, because that's what's usually available, or the flowers, if they're available, are mixed with water and then given to the dying to help their souls fly to heaven. Oh, that is so nice. <laughs> so, for the people who are not involved in that, the people who do use Tulsi medicinally, and uh, especially in India, that is the Ayurvedic tradition of um, working with plants for thousands and thousands of years. Ayurveda has honored Tulsi again as a supreme healing herb. As a matter of fact, the most ancient Ayurvedic text that we have 
talks about palsy as the elixir of life, which will promote longevity in everyone. And one of the nicest ways to take it is to dry the palsy and powder it and mix it with ghee and then use it for cooking food. Well, I have ghee here. We're going to have to try that. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I, too, very much like Tulsi tea. And there's several, um, it seems very uh, nice uh, people bringing that um, onto the market in a way that it seems very uplifting to me. And I also have not tried it. I was at Green Nation's. This fall, and Pam Montgomery brought a Tulsi plant with her, and she also had a machine that she had gotten in Italy that allows plants through electrical resistance to make sounds, and she hooked the Tulsi up to this machine, and the Tulsi sang for us. Oh, that's beautiful. It was quite amazing, quite indeed so what can we say about Tulsi? We are looking at the mints, and it does a lot of the things that we have come to expect that the mints will do, right? It's a decongestant. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's an anti-allergic. It's adaptogenic, germicidal, fungicidal, antibacterial, antibiotic, an expectorant, an antitussive, a diuretic. It's pain relieving. It's antioxidant and it's anti-cancer. About the only thing on here that I don't see that I would expect a mint to do is something for the digestive system, huh? Right. Right. So. We could have put Tulsi in with the mints that we were looking at last month because those were mints that were especially effective at relieving anxiety and helping our mood. And there was a pretty good study uh, done five years ago. It's about 35 adults with generalized anxiety disorder. And they found that taking a Tulsi capsule daily for 60 days brought them to much lower levels of stress and less depression. Uh, I think that most of us would agree that a cup of Tulsi tea would be far preferable and that it would ease your depression as soon as you smelled it. This is a plant that really smells wonderful. A 2006, that was about eight years ago, study on rabbits found that Tulsi lowered cholesterol and had wonderful antioxidant effects within the blood, helping to prevent the oxidation of the uh, little proteins in the blood. And then a really early study, one going back more than 10 years ago, they found that giving mice Tulsi protected them against mercury-induced toxicity. So that's a lovely thing to think about. You're concerned that you may have eaten too much tuna at some point or that in some other way you've gotten involved with mercury. Some Tulsi tea could help take care of that. And Tulsi has been found to mitigate against the effects of radiation exposure. So from the ancient Ayurvedic idea of being protected by Tulsi to the modern day, we can see how Tulsi actually does work. And here's the most interesting one of all. A study done in 2009, five years ago, on mice, found that Tulsi protected them against Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a hospital-acquired bacteria that causes pneumonia and urinary tract infections. So the next time you're in the hospital, take a box of Tulsi tea bags with you. Tulsi oil has also been shown to show activity against E. coli, S. aureus, and P. algerinosa, some nasty bacteria. If you saw them in the lineup, you would say, yeah, those are the bad ones. Tulsi, of course, being a mint and an aromatic plant, has a volatile oil, which can be 
concentrated into an essential oil. And that essential oil, as we said, shows activity against some of the worst bacteria. It's probably also a COX-2 inhibitor, which means that it can relieve pain through interesting pathways. It is also antihyperlipidemic. In other words, the oil itself, the essential oil can help to lower cholesterol. And it is cardioprotective, especially in rats that are fed a high fat diet. I was just uh, talking to my daughter down in Costa Rica and they've been there for nearly a month now and they're adapting to being there rather than trying to make it adapt to them. They're doing their best to adapt to it and, and so their favorite fats, olive oil and butter, are not in easy supply there. So they're moving into using more lard. So perhaps when I go and visit, I'll take them a couple of boxes of Tulsi tea and help protect them against that higher fat diet. And the essential oil of Tulsi is also used in herbal cosmetics, especially things for the skin. And we're going to find oleanolic acid in there, ursolic acid, rosmarinic acid, eugenol, carvacrol, linalol, beta cariophyllene, beta alanine, germacrinine, canfine, and cineol. Ooh, lots of interesting things there. Tulsi has typically been used for its effects on the pulmonary system to treat asthma, bronchitis, arthritis, colds, and flus. But modern herbalists tend to use Tulsi to counter stress, relieve anxiety, protect against environmental pollution, ease headaches, and to aid those who have cardiovascular disease. Here are some of the ways that we can use Tulsi. Chew on fresh Tulsi leaves if you feel a cold coming on. If you don't have fresh Tulsi leaves, use two tea bags to make a cup of tea and then slowly simmer that down to half a cup. If you want to, you can add a clove or two while you're simmering down and then once it's simmered down, put some honey in that. Really immediate relief of colds and flus, it is said. Or you could use that very same boiled down decoction with some honey to ease a sore throat. Because Tulsi helps to modulate the immune system to suppress the cough centers and to expulse phlegm as well as being an antibacterial, it is in almost all Ayurvedic cough syrups and expectorants. Just like we're doing, take the dried leaves, a couple of tea bags, a cup of boiling water, boil it lightly down to half a cup and add honey. Sometimes ginger is added added as well, especially where there is chronic bronchitis or where the mucus seems to be especially thick because Tulsi can reduce the level of the stress hormone cortisol, soothe the nerves, and regulate the nervous system. It helps us to move more gracefully through our days. The ideal use of Tulsi as an adaptogen is to chew a few fresh leaves. When I'm doing something like this, if I possibly can, like if your husband has a Tulsi plant and he wants to experiment with using Tulsi as an adaptogen, then my suggestion is the first thing in the morning before he brushes his teeth, before he drinks his morning coffee, before anything else goes in his mouth, those Tulsi leaves go in his mouth and he chews them and he sits with the Tulsi plant and with the taste of the Tulsi and allows that to be the opening note of his day. That sounds like a perfect day um, when you start like that, doesn't it? Doesn't it, though? It does. Ah, it's like puts a smile on your face. Absolutely. One of the classic Ayurvedic uses for Tulsi is to help relieve headaches. 
and it's especially useful to relieve headaches that come about because of inflammation like sinusitis, allergies, colds, and regular use of Tulsi is said to prevent migraine. In India, they take the fresh Tulsi leaves, pound them, and then apply them directly to the forehead. And they say that the Tulsi leaves are cooling. And they cool off a fevered brain or a fevered mind. And I think about that kind of headache that I get when I've been out in the sun too much. And I imagine how wonderful Tulsi would feel for that. If you don't have the fresh Tulsi plant, then you can make a cup of tea and dip a cloth in the Tulsi tea and apply that cloth to the forehead to relieve the headache. Or some people say, okay, you can do that. And you know, isn't that nice that you can do that and lay down, close your eyes and kind of get out of it for a while. Or if you really can't afford to take the time, sipping Tulsi tea can also help. And it's supposed to help sharpen the memory as well. So while you're sipping that Tulsi tea to get rid of the stress headache that you have from working, uh, where you're working, you can say to yourself, yes, Well, this will help me think better. This will help me remember better. This will strengthen my immune system and my nervous system, and this work will be easier. One of the most interesting uses that I found for Tulsi was the using the fresh juice in the eyes to relieve night blindness. And the original remedy says to use black Tulsi. The modern translation, of course, is purple pulsy, is the one that is juiced. And the night blindness, and of course throughout India, blindness is frequently caused by lack of vitamin A. And my guess is that the dark purple um, pulsy has a lot of vitamin A. Now, whether or not they can actually be used right there in the eye itself by dropping the juice in the eye, I don't know, but very interesting idea. The same juice, but sweetened with a little honey, is used to dissolve kidney stones and reduce uric acid levels. Tulsi contains acetic acid that can actually break down and dissolve kidney stones, and it has a pain-killing effect. So that helps when you are dealing with those kidney stones. Tulsi has a great reputation for helping people who are dealing with acne, itchy scalp, and ringworm. The dried leaves are powdered and mixed in with coconut oil, and that is then applied to the scalp or the skin, wherever there's a problem, and that is said to prevent baldness and hair loss as well. Interestingly enough, it's been used successfully by some naturopaths in the treatment of leukoderma, which is a kind of difficult to deal with skin problem. If you dry your Tulsi leaves and then powder them, you could also use it as a toothpaste or a dentifrice. In Ayurvedic medicine, Tulsi is said to counteract bad breath, to kill the bacteria that cause gum disease and tooth decay, and to prevent and cure ulcers and infections in the mouth and the teeth. Children in general don't like Tulsi so much. It's a rather, shall we say, adult taste. It's pretty strong, not bitter, but very strong. But Many Ayurvedic physicians say that if a child is dealing with cold, cough, fever, diarrhea, or vomiting, and you have Tulsi at hand, Tulsi tea could be the easiest remedy. For chicken pox, Tulsi tea with a little bit of saffron is considered to be something that will help your child move through the chicken pox as quickly as possible. For children with fevers, Tulsi boiled with powdered cardamom in a 
couple of cups of water and then boil down to one cup and mix with honey and milk or sugar and milk and sipped until the fever has been reduced. Dulcie, like many, many mints, is not well liked by insects. And so Dulcie has been used both to prevent and to treat insects things as well as infestations from insects. For centuries in India, dry Tulsi leaves have been mixed with stored grains as one way to keep the insects out of those grains. In Sri Lanka, Tulsi is rubbed on the skin to stop mosquitoes from biting one. And a application of the fresh juice will take the itch out of Mosquito bites, if you haven't been so wise as to use the Tulsi beforehand. And a paste of the fresh Tulsi roots. And we pause here because we think, what would induce one to dig up a Tulsi plant? We've already heard, you know, how incredibly holy and sacred this is and how it could go on and spreading. What would induce one to dig up the root of Tulsi to get rid of leech bites? Yeah, I think I'd do it for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> leeches. <laughs> yeah, duck. Right, we don't have much truck of leeches where we do. I, I used to uh, frequent a pond where there were leeches in the pond, and I often did not go in that pond because of the leeches. So. Right. <laughs> It's like, oh, there's leech. And, you know, when you take them off, it just bleeds and bleeds. And I'm envisioning the Tulsi, right, that you take the root of the Tulsi and pound that up and use that as a poultice. And it's really going to just stop whatever is going on. Tulsi seeds are occasionally used. It's usually the leaves that are used. And throughout all that we have been talking about here with the Tulsi, it is the leaves, sometimes the leaves and the stalks that are used. But we've ended here with a note that the root is also sometimes used. So again, if you have a plant that is frost killed, that would be an opportunity to use that root. Have you noticed that even in the dead parts of most mint family plants, the aroma continues on very strong for some time? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So... I sometimes, you know, find it difficult to, to move those kind of dead pieces of mint family plants on. It's like, oh, they still smell good. Surely there's something else I can do with them. It turns out that the seeds of Tulsi contain a mucilage. Yeah. And so here we have a whole other quality from the plant. And that is the quality of soothing. And using the seeds both to soothe internally, mucilaginous seeds like plantain seeds are often used to move the food matter through the bowels in a more effective fashion. Or sometimes they're soaked and that kind of slippery mucilage is used to uh, deal with the kinds of things that we said that Tulsi is best at which is soothing sore throats, coughs, and pulmonary complaints. And so that leads us back around full circle. Although it's not usually mentioned or thought about the leaves having this much mucilage, I suspect that since this is one of Tulsi's really strong points, that there is indeed some interesting mucilage there. Well, Gemini, as always, it is a delight talking to you about the marvelous means. And we're going to come back next week, and we're going to talk about Shiso. And Shiso is possibly one of the least known of the marvelous mints. And I hope that you enjoy your week and that you enjoy your time with your husband and Tulsi. Come and visit me, listeners, at SusanWeed.com, and you'll find my books at the TheWiseWomanBookshop.com. Green blessings, everyone, and remember that herbal medicine is people's medicine. Thank you, Susan. This concludes Part 13 of our 20-part series, Marvelous Mints, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio.